that is kind of easy to understand. Chapter 10, muscle tissue. First thing to remember is that muscle is a pretty simple functional tissue. Its job is to move things. If you're moving your body, your whole body movements, moving your limbs, walking across the floor, that's muscle. If you're moving something within your body and doing it on purpose, gravity does have an effect on some places, but if you're doing something purposeful like pumping blood or drawing air in and out of your lungs or even moving urine from your kidney to your bladder, it's muscle that does that. Movement uh, might be voluntary, so I can get up and walk across the room uh, as a voluntary activity, something that I choose to do, and that's the job of my skeletal muscles. Many of the other muscular movements are controlled autonomically, so things like heartbeat to propel the blood and breathing rate to move air in and out. is controlled by muscles, but it's autonomic systems and their sensors that actually provide our index, provide our pacing for those kinds of activities. So we're gonna begin by just noting that the prefix or root for muscle is myo. Myofibril means muscle fiber. The second prefix we're going to run into is sarco. This is a microscopic structure. And it kind of reiterates something I say again and again. Why do we keep looking at the cell level and the chemical level? The answers are there. And so what we're going to see in the sarcomere are individual protein fibers, two kinds of protein. And when we stimulate a muscle nerve junction with a nerve impulse to make that muscle start contracting, it's the interaction between those proteins that causes the shortening of this unit that we call the sarcomere. So we're going to begin by working our way from the gross muscle, the named muscle in our body, which is something that we can see on our uh, sensory system level. We can see an individual muscle in the human body. We're going to work our way down to this sarcomere, which is the functional unit. I want to make a point about the muscle system. That is a little counter to our intuitive development of our language. I made the point for the skeletal system that bone is so different, we typically call them bones. We don't think of them as organs, but a bone is an organ. The same thing applies to muscles. An individual named muscle, like this biceps brachii, it's individually identifiable because if you sever its connection to the bones, its tendons, the muscle essentially lifts out as an independent unit. That biceps brachii is an organ of the muscle system. And what we're going to see in muscles is how good the human body is at making tubes. Because the muscle is basically a tube. Its shape may be fan-shaped. But basically within it, we're going to find a series of fibers or tubes. As we look at a muscle, we're going to see that the overall muscle consists of smaller tubes, which consist of smaller tubes, which consist of smaller tubes. So there's a tube within a tube within a tube within a tube organization. And each level of organization must basically be packaged and uh, supported on its own. So it's going to have its own membrane. So we're going to start with this named muscle, like the biceps brachii. The skeletal muscle is the organ, and it's surrounded by a membrane called the epimysium. A point to make about muscles, since they're all about moving, is that when they move, they scrape against the muscles that are next to them, the bones. Sometimes they scrape against the tissues of the epithelium or connective tissue. There's a lot of opportunity for friction. And of course, scraping and friction is not good inside the body. It wears cells out. So these membranes are going to be enclosing these units of organization. They're going to be lubricated. They're going to be kind of stretchy strong, sort of like a sheet, like maybe saran wrap. They will stretch, but they'll also slide back and forth with very, very small amounts of resistance. 
within the skeletal muscle, when we cut across it, we see it's a, it's a bunch of bundled fibers called fascicles. The fascicle is the second level of organization, and we can often see these with the naked eye as well. The membrane around the fascicle is a separate membrane called the paramecium. And we cut across the fascicle and we see smaller fibers yet. This fiber is surrounded by a membrane, the sarcolemma and the endomysium are right on top of each other. And this is the closest we have to an individual cell. We have to admit that the muscle fiber is going to be a very unusual cell. I'll show you pictures that establish that in a second. But within the fiber, we see strings of sarcomeres. This is called a myofibril. And these multiple myofibrils are arranged sort of like pencils in a circular box. And they are lying edge to edge and they're surrounded by the ground substance within the fiber. That's called the sarcoplasm. So let's repeat this sarco organization. The sarcolemma is the membrane around the muscle fiber that contains the functional unit. The myofibril is a string that's made of sarcomeres that are hooked end to end like boxcars. And they are bathed and surrounded by a sarcoplasm like the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, the sarcomere is going to be something that we're going to explain in detail. That sarcomere is the contracting unit. The sarcomere is what gets shorter when you stimulate the muscle, and you're going to stimulate that out here at the fiber level. When you stimulate a fiber, all of the myofibrils in that fiber and all of the sarcomeres along those myofibrils contract at the same signal. So we're going to illustrate this now with figures. Here's this skeletal muscle. This would be a named muscle that will be uh, basically we'll have a lot of muscle names starting with next Monday's lecture. This epimysium, you'll notice, has the typical enclosing and uh, lubricating um, uh, function, but also supporting the blood vessels, the lymph vessels, and the nerves, which have to penetrate this uh, structure. But cut across it, and what do you see? We have an epimysium surrounding it, and we have bundles of fibers within it. These are called fascicles. So this is an extended fascicle, which we have blown up, magnified in the figure below. We see the perimysium, the membrane of the fascicle, supporting its blood vessels and nerves, still largely running along the outside edge, and containing smaller bundles. You see these bundles? Look at those black jelly bean-like uh, uh, substances. And at, at this level, it's probably the nucleus we're seeing. And smaller fibers inside this smaller unit. This is called a fiber, blown up in the drawing below. This is the endomysium and sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the enclosing membrane, and the fiber is the closest thing we get to a cell, although it will be unusual. This is meant to represent a nucleus. You'll notice that at this level, the inside of the fiber is filled with smaller circles. And these smaller circles are the myofibrils. We'll get to them in a moment. But also along that, you see these black kind of mottled uh, structures. Those are mitochondria. Mitochondria because muscles burn ATP faster than anything else we have. And as a result, we put the mitochondria right here for making ATP within the muscle. These smaller fibers are called myofibrils. And for those, we're going to go all the way up here for two drawings up the right. This is a similar illustration showing a piece of a myofibril. And you'll notice right in here, this Z-shaped, this zigzag red line, that's called the Z line. And they identify the end plate of a sarcomere. So between those uh, zigzag lines, that's one sarcomere, 
and it's going to be wrapped in its own blue membrane and tied with its own yellow strings. This is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, it's this unit, the muscle fiber, that has the common sarcoplasm bathing all of these myofibrils. So when we add another membrane, this sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we tie it up with these yellow tubes, we're going to have actually three spaces. The space within the uh, yellow fiber, yellow tubes, which are called T-tubules, the space within the blue net-like membrane that's wrapping the sarcomere. This is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You can see that it's hollow from its cut ends. And finally, the sarcoplasm that's going to bathe this entire structure. When we draw it in another way, we see the zigzag lines representing an end plate made of these red fibers. These are called thin fibers because of their appearance in the electron microscope. You'll notice that they form the end plate and the red fibers extend toward the center, but do not reach it. They are tied only the end plate. This midline or M line is made of the thick fiber, the purple fiber, and its fibers extend from the middle in both directions toward the end plate, but you'll notice, do not reach it. These are thin fibers in red, are actin proteins, and the thick fibers in purple are myosin. Those are the two proteins, actin and myosin, that allow muscles to contract. It is this area of overlap that produces that movement. These two proteins form cross bonds with each other. When they form those bonds, the bonds flex and pull the actin and ends toward the midline. They do that from both directions. So basically, we're going to be contracting by pulling these zigzag lines in toward the center from both directions. As we uh, take a power stroke, a single step, we then uh, uh, basically break the connection, form a new one, and flex again. So we'll, we will look at that process in detail in just a moment. Going back to the structure, here are a couple of important points about the muscle fiber. That's what we're looking at here is a muscle fiber. This is an electron micrograph, and this is, as you can see, 600 times magnification, so fairly high magnification for the light microscope, but well within the range of the light microscope. It reveals a fiber that has distinct stripes called striations, and those as well are related to the sarcomere structure. Because not only are there many, many myofibrils running from uh, left to right here, but the sarcomeres are lined up so that their Z lines alternate with the clear space between. So there's an alternation of structure that's aligned across this fiber and produces these stripes. The darker spots you'll see, and you'll notice in certain places, it shows that they're not throughout the fiber. They're actually pushed to the edge. You can kind of see this one's on the surface, and this one um, is, you know, you can see it's right at the surface of the sarcolemma. Same thing here and here. So these are basically the, the darker ones are the ones on the membrane on this side of the micrograph, and the fuzzy ones are the ones that are on the circle on the other side. These are all nuclei. So one thing that makes this fiber very unusual is the cell. It's a multinucleate cell, and it's large. These fibers can grow up to 30 centimeters long. 2.54 centimeters per inch means 25.4 centimeters is 10 inches. So we're looking at something that could be a foot long. Very unusual for a cellular, quote, type structure. How do they form? Well, we start out with the stem cells called myoblast. Do you remember blast meant making or becoming in bones? Osteoblast. Well, myoblasts are the cells that are going to become muscle, and they start out as these kind of standard single nucleus cells. 
of two types. One will form the muscle structure itself, and others will form a thing called a myosatellite. It's a kind of a maintenance or a building and ground cell. But the thing that's unusual about these myoblasts is they fuse. See, they've already fused. So now we have a cell with two nuclei and more fuse. So here we have a cell with four nuclei, and we grow the fiber that way. This process continues until we have this long, long structure and a structure that between these striations can produce contraction. So overall, we can contract this muscle quite a ways. This enlarged diagram kind of makes a better point of the location of those nuclei on the surface. Why would we have so many nuclei? Why would that be a benefit? We explained the mitochondria when we use the muscles the, the ATP is going to be burned so fast that it makes real sense to just import the carbohydrate, fat, or amino acid into the muscle fiber itself and make the ATP right on the spot. But what about the nuclei? Well, this is something that's moving, which means that it's wearing, it's breaking down. These actin and myosin fibers that we saw have to be replaced on a frequent basis. There is repair and replacement going on in our muscles all the time. And that means that we need to manufacture protein. So having the genes right inside the fiber means that you can basically convert these nuclei to well, actin and myosin production. Also, there's a thing called titan and other proteins, but you can basically manufacture those right in these working uh, fibers. So let's go take our closer look. This is the muscle fiber shown above with its striations and nuclei around the sarcolemma. That yellow on the left, right in here, that's the sarcoplasm that is bathing each one of these myofibrils and also giving host to these mitochondria. What we've done up here is kind of amplify the diagram to show you the individual myofibrils and their membrane wrappings, which have been uh, blown up down here. Here's that outer sarcolemma, and the striations are kind of drawn up, drawn uh, up in the in the uh, edges. And you can notice a couple of structures. This is the myofibril with its actin and myosin fibers drawn in. This is the longitudinal section showing you from here to here the boundary of one section to sarcomere. You'll also notice there that as soon as you reach the end plate of the sarcomere, the next sarcomere starts. So it really is a continuous strand. Each of these myofibrils is wrapped. You can see that there's a a net-like blue membrane. Its cut edges show you that it's hollow. So the sarcoplasm occupies all the spaces around these myofibril and membrane structures. The space inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum then is a different space, and therefore a different chemical reaction can occur in it. And then we tie around each sarcomere. We basically, it looks like we have tied these uh, net-like sarcoplasmic reticulum elements to the outside of the sarcomere by these T-tubules shown in yellow. The cut ends show you it is hollow too. Now, an interesting thing, the spaces inside these are distinct and continuous. Notice that the yellow spaces, here are the T-tubule wrappings. This T-tubule coming from the internal part of the fiber forms a junction with this one and this one and then continues over here and reaches an opening. This opening of the T-tubule is outside the sarcolemma. When we stimulate this membrane with a nerve impulse, it's going to race over here. And when it gets to here, it's basically going to go down the inside of this membrane and spread around every uh, sarcomere and around every sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's one space. The second space is this continuous space within the 
blue membrane. This hole leads under the T tubule through this net like reticulum to the next T tubule junction under it and over here, and it just keeps going embedded in the fiber. So we're going to, three spaces generally is going to mean three different functions. But there are other spaces, of course. The nucleus is a space and the mitochondria, shown here in purple and cut sections, but the dense packing of, of um, the mitochondria throughout this fiber is clearly indicated uh, in this figure. So let's just look at the terminology, sarcoplasmic reticulum wrapped around the sarcomere, and it forms what's called a triad. The triad structure was well looked at. They said in the first electron micrographs where they could really see the sarcoplasmic reticulum, they said, well, look, it looks like there's three uh, structures. There are two chambers, we call those uh, terminal cisternae, that are held down by a central T tubule. What's going to happen in these cisternae, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is the muscle fiber is going to concentrate calcium. Calcium as a soluble ion. When we release the calcium, it stimulates the sarcomeres to begin contracting. We'll see that in a moment. When we take a look at this overall structure again, we see the sarcoplasmic reticulum and what we would call a triad from here to here. The two cisternae. A cistern is a term we use in our waste systems and it's basically just a chamber for the collection of that water waste um, or a collection of, uh, I guess a cistern can be used to collect fresh water as well. So two cisternae on either side of this T tubule. This is the triad structure that alternates along every myofibril. Finally, we get to an electron micrograph. Now, before we were looking at 600 times magnification in a light microscope to really see a sarcomere, you need 64,000 times magnification. And you absolutely need a special kind of staining and preparation, but when you when you do it right, this is what it looks like. So I want to point out, for instance, this is one sarcomere right here. But on the other side, here's the beginning of the next one. And to the right, here's the beginning of the adjacent one on the right. So sarcomeres one, two, three, form a continuous myofibril. We call these the Z line. It turns out that it's 64,000. That's not enough magnification to actually see the real zigzag pattern of that actin. They kind of blend together. When you crank up the magnification, you can actually see the Z pattern. So we call this the I band, a light band, alternating with this A band, which is the dense staining band. And you can kind of see the dark light, dark alternation that produces the striations. Uh, here we have, from the Z line, we have this area, only thin fibers cross this area on the left and on the right. So it looks kind of dense, uh, light colored, kind of uh, not dense, but very light in its content. Whereas here we have the M line, those thick fibers form the M line and the H band. And then the thick fibers overlapping the thin fibers on each side, producing this electron dense or dark region of the center, what we call the A-band of the uh, structure. This drawing is kind of, requires a little bit of explanation, but it's worth the work because it really helps you envision the structure of the sarcomere. We are definitely working at the molecular level here because a thick fiber is a single protein fiber. A thin fiber is a thinner but still a single protein fiber. So let's take a look. If we cut across this Z line, what we see is a very regular arrangement of actin molecules. Do you notice how 
I'm going to put the pointer right in the center. Notice how there's a regular hexagon uh, surrounding that pointer. Notice how it's formed by six equilateral triangles, very rigid structures, and everything is bonded to everything else. A regular crystal lattice type packing. Now this green structure I haven't explained yet. It's actually another molecule called Titan. Titan has an important function in holding the sarcomere together. When you're contracting a sarcomere, it gets real short, but then you stretch it back out, getting ready to attract it. You actually could pull it apart. If you pull it apart, it's not going to work anymore. So the Titan is sort of like a spring, like that spring on your screen door. When you stretch it out far enough, the Titan comes tight and prevents the area of overlap, basically pulling this apart so that there's no longer any overlap. So these are the end plates. And this structure would be seen here and here. If you cut here in the thin fiber region, all you see is this same pattern without the cross legs. Notice at, from the pointer, notice the hexagon of, of actin that's surrounding the pointer. And you notice the central position of the titan. The titan is surrounded by by six molecules of actin in a regular hexagon. Notice that each actin is surrounded by an equilateral triangle of titan. So there's a lot of force, a lot of resistance by the fibers of the titan across this fiber. Now, if we go to the M line, we're going to see the thick fibers arranged in a very similar way in regular uh, equilateral triangles that form, if you look at the pointer, there's a hexagon of those in a very regular packing uh, around that central uh, point. If you look just a little bit over here, here you've got thick fibers, but you don't have the actin yet. And so what you see is that same pattern without the crosslinks, but look, the titan, which is embedded in the end plate, is shown as embedded clear into the thick fibers. So that's what keeps from keeps you from pulling the end off when you stretch the muscle back out. So those are all the kind of accessory areas. The real area of business for the contracting muscle is this area of overlap on the left and right. Because you're going to be able to contract toward the midline from both directions, there's sort of an equal pull of the two end points toward the center. And when you look at overlap, you see these structures regularly alternating without the cross links. Now, if the area of overlap between actin and myosin is what's going to be uh, the region where we form those cross links, those special chemical bonds, then the more exposure of actin to, to myosin that you have, the more cross links you can form. And look at this. Every myosin is surrounded by six actin molecules. So when you uh, basically stimulate that myosin, it doesn't just bind to this one. It can bind over 360 degrees to six different actin molecules. If you look at each actin, it is surrounded by and worked upon by three different myosins. So when we start forming cross bridges, they're going to form all over the place because of the structure of these protein fibers. Here's what we saw and diagrammed as the sarcomere, the Z-line end plate. Notice the titan hooked to the Z-line and hooked into the end of the myosin. Now it's going to penetrate all the way in here. Notice how it's kind of uh, uh, bunched up or kind of coiled up so that you basically can shorten this It'll, it'll compress this spring, but when you pull it back in this direction, if it goes too far, this is going to tighten up and keep you from pulling the actin off of the myosin. When we look inside this Z-line, we see this actin to titan bond alternating left and right between the adjacent sarcomeres. When we blow up a piece of this, what looks like coiled wire at one magnification, we can see a number of different actin elements, this tropomyosin and troponin, 
forms a kind of like a barb, a, kind of like a, a coiled wire structure. There's a central nebulon line shown, and these, these coiling tropomyosin and troponin elements around the outside, and they hold the active actin mole, uh, molecules. Now, the actin is drawn as a sphere, and that sphere has an orange and yellow uh, 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 region on it. The yellow site is the active site. That's what's going to form bonds, what we call cross bridges, with the myosin when we stimulate the fiber. But you'll also notice something else is that right now this is at rest and the troponin and tropomyosin are lying right on top of those active sites. So uh, uh, an initial observation, actin is actively suppressed from contraction when we're at rest. We not only are just not contracting, we have locked this actin in a, uh, a protected position. It cannot contract as long as this troponin and tropomyosin covers the active site. We'll try to explain that in just a moment. First, let's look at the um, thick fibers. Now, this is an individual myosin molecule. Looks to me like a golf club. The only difference between this and a golf club is this head has a hinge that allows it to flex. So if you use energy, you can uh, push this head out to this position. It binds to an actin, and when you it binds, it basically flexes in this direction, pulling the actin along with it. So these golf clubs are kind of, if you assemble them like this, if you can imagine holding 25 drivers, and right down here, you're holding all the handles together. All the heads are sticking out 360 degrees around this, this fiber. This is what the thick fiber actually looks like. And this is why the actin surrounds it so completely. So you have six actins around it at the top and bottom, and about at this position and at this position, away from the fiber toward you, and two more hidden behind the fiber to form a perfect hexagon. That means these heads will react with the actin molecule that's nearest and flex, pulling the actin toward the midline. So an overview of muscle action is shown here. And this is a big payback lesson because we're going to start with the nerve impulse coming down the uh, uh, nerve system from the brain, basically saying, okay, I'm going to move my arm now. Let's stimulate this fiber in the biceps brachii and flex the elbow. Here's the nerve impulse, and it's traveling down the axon of the nerve to this telodendria area. This is the neuromuscular junction, and it works fiber by fiber. When this arrives, the stimulation of the nerve impulse that causes the reaction by the muscle fiber explains nerve action. If you understand how we stimulate a muscle to contract, all you're going to need to understand how we pass a nerve impulse from one part of the body, like a sensor in your finger, all the way up to the brain, is to replace that muscle fiber with another nerve. This excitation on the membrane of the fiber, the sarcolemma, and it arrives here. This is the, uh, basically, this is the presynaptic, I'm, I'm sorry, hold on. See this space where the pointer is, is uh, arcing? That space is called a synapsis. And nerves work not by contact but by working across this space with a chemical step. That's going to be the same for nerve-to-nerve -nerve connections. So here comes the nerve impulse. It causes a release of a neurotransmitter substance into this synapse. And if enough is released, we stimulate the sarcolemma. Now it's going to spread out in all directions, an action potential. It's going to spread in all directions from this particular synapse. 
when it gets to a hole, it races down this membrane. This is the T-tubule. So the T-tubule is transferring a, an electrical impulse. And when we get to the sarcomere, it hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum and stimulates that. Now, here's where the calcium comes in. Calcium is released into the sarcoplasm all across the fiber. Now, what the sarco, what the calcium is going to do is to unlock those actin active sites by moving the troponin and tropomyosin out of the way. Calcium does that specific job. When that happens, actin to myosin cross bridges begin to form. They begin to do those power strokes. So they basically, a myosin head, how can I do this? will bind power stroke, then bind an ATP, which will cause the release and cock it back to the beginning. And it's ready to bind, stroke, release, and cock again. Just does that over and over again as long as the stimulus occurs. Now, one cross bridge produces very little force, but when you talk about hundreds of millions to billions, it causes a pulling of the end plates, the Z lines, toward the M line. And when you're contracting all of these sarcomeres across the fiber, that means the muscle fiber gets shorter. At the end of the muscle fibers, what do we have? Connective tissue, connecting them to other fibers or connecting them and ultimately to the tendon on the end of the muscle. So the sarcomere contraction is added up across the myofibril, across the fiber, across the fascicle, eventually across the whole muscle, and the tension causes the muscle to shorten. Now, different results occur depending on how the muscle is attached to the skeletal system or to the wall of an organ. And we'll consider that in a moment. First, I kind of want to blow up these diagrams, take that overview, and go step by step through the anatomy pointing out all the structures that you see here and explaining every step of muscle contraction. The neuron is shown here, a multipolar neuron in the long axon. This is a white matter neuron. You can see the Schwann cells encasing the axon and an electrical impulse traveling down here to the neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. There we have this synapse. So these individual strands are shown here. This blue is the nerve, uh, 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 the nerve uh, membrane, and within it, mitochondria and vesicles that hold a chemical called neurotransmitter substance. Down below, you can see the membrane of the sarco, the sarcolemma of the fiber. The individual myofibrils with their uh, actin and myosin strands drawn in, in a very regular array. And uh, on the outside, mitochondria and sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the nerve impulse arrives and there is a several step process. Here is the resting synapse. This is the muscle side, the sarcolemma and the sarcoplasm are here. This is the nerve side, the membrane of the telodendrion and vesicles containing a neurotransmitter substance. In this case, ACH stands for acetylcholine because it activates all our skeletal muscles. Acetylcholine was the first discovered neurotransmitter and it's by far the best known. Now, acetylcholine ACH activates all our skeletal muscles and it is the chemical step in nerve transmission. The speed of the nervous system comes from that electrical impulse that moves so rapidly from one end of the long cell to the other. But it is at the synapse where it's going to activate these vesicles filled with neurotransmitter. Without the neurotransmitter, the impulse stops there. So this is at rest. 
Other things you will notice in the synapse, there's a an esterase called acetylcholine esterase. It's a substance that breaks acetylcholine down. And here in the end plate, we see these purple receptors empty. So they're not generating any stimulus at all, but ready to bind once acetylcholine is released. So here comes the nerve impulse. We're depolarizing a membrane, which is an electrical term, which means we're changing its voltage relationship across the membrane. It's racing down here beyond the speeds that we can comprehend. And as it arrives, its first effect is to cause those vesicles to fuse and dump their neurotransmitter into the synapse. So you're filling this synapse with neurotransmitter as the impulse passes. Now it quickly diffuses across and binds these receptors, which opens sodium gates and sodium from the synapse rushes across. Now we we've used the term depolarization. Depolarize would be observed as a voltage change so if there's a resting potential of minus 80 and we depolarize by moving sodium, it would become minus 60, minus 50, minus 40 as it moves across. Now, as all of these get uh, bound and more and more sodium rushes in, it produces a thing called an active potential, which then will travel all over the uh, sarcolemma of the fiber. Let's, uh, let's look at that in just a moment. So nerve impulse arrives, neurotransmitter is dumped, and sodium gates open. Now, uh, this electrical impulse that's generated is rushing over the entire membrane. So it would be rushing up here. Every place you see the uh, sarcolemma, I'm sorry, the... Uh, yeah, the sarcolemma would be depolarized. But what's happened here is you're at the, that hole from the T-tube. So it turns the corner and goes down the hole, just like down the rabbit hole, and penetrates across the entire thickness width of the fiber by following that space that's within all the T-tubules and radiating across out, surrounding the sarcoplasmic reticulum of all the myofibrils. Now, before we leave this behind, as soon as we generate this impulse, these acetylcholine esterase start binding these acetylcholines and stripping them off of the receptor, placing this portion of the membrane back at rest. Typically, we're going to break down and reclaim some of these parts, transport some of this, and notably the choline part back in here, and package it for another uh, a stimulus yet to come. Now, we left that impulse out here on the, maybe way out here, way out here on the border of the fiber, the sarcolemma, and it's coming down through these T-tubules. When it arrives at this particular triad, this sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's going to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum through membrane-to-membrane -membrane contact. Now that causes the calcium that's stored in high concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. See why the different space was necessary? A different closed space. When we're not contracting, we're going to be pumping calcium into there and making it rich in calcium. Because when this pops open, calcium is going to rush out into and among the myofibrils, into and among the sarcomere within that uh, fiber. So we have a three-step process here. This is the locked configuration when we're looking on it by the end. Here's the myosin tail and a, a head of myosin. Notice the troponin and tropomyosin are on top of the yellow active site. This is the actin strand. And we're, we're basically only drawing these two myosin strands near it, but not forming any cross bridges because it's blocked by tropomyosin and troponin. The calcium arrives, and what happens? It rotates those off, exposing the active site. And when that happens, these myosin heads react to them, whop, whop, and form these connections called 
across bridges. Now, this is a very limited figure. And for this to work in your mind, what you absolutely must do is go back to that idea of six surrounding one and three surrounding one, allowing literally hundreds of millions of cross bridges to form in one myofibril when it is stimulated. So let's take a look down the line and look at the process of cross bridge formation. Here we are ready to begin the contraction and we're only looking at one actin strand. The troponin and tropomyosin are in place on the active sites. The myosin heads have ADP bound to them. And because they're pointing to the right, that tells you that the midline is over here on the left. These are cocked and ready to go. They are energetically uh, prepared to form cross bridges. But with the block on the actin, nothing can happen. The impulse arrives at the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium is dumped. You can see the calcium arriving here. And what it causes is a rotation of the troponin and tropomyosin exposing these active sites. Now you can see the yellow is completely free. So once you unlock that actin strand, there's going to be four steps. Bind, power stroke, release, and then ATP binding and cocking. You're going to use one ATP to go through one complete power stroke. So let's see if I can get something like animation or animation effect here as we are ready. This is unlocked. So we're going to bind. Notice how they were attracted up to the nearest active site. Power stroke, it pulls it from right to left. And the ADP and P that's on it is released. Now, you know what happens to ADP and P. It just becomes more substrate for that aerobic respiration that's going on in mitochondria. We're going to take another phosphate, stick it right on that ADP, back to ATP, and we can use it again. So power stroke, release. You'll notice the release occurs with the new ATP binding to the surface of the myosin and breaking down to ADP and P, and that causes the myosin head to cock back to its beginning position. So I kind of describe this as four steps, and it goes like this. Bind, power stroke. Now notice it's only moved the actin kind of one space. It was here. No, it's moved it to here. Power stroke, ADP release, ATP binding, and cocking the myosin head. Now it's ready. It just moved this actin to this position. It's now ready to bind this actin and move it to this position. Now that sounds like such a long explanation. Gosh, it took so long to go through all those words. But as things get smaller and smaller, as you go from the scale of an arm to the scale of an individual muscle to the scale of a fascicle, fiber, myofibril, and sarcomeres, you're down on that level that required 600 or 64,000 magnifications to visualize. Things can happen so fast that they literally cannot be imagined. Um, and that's what's really happening is the lightning fast recurrence of this cross bridge, bridge formation using ATP in great quantities and causing the myosin fibers and the actin fibers to slide past one another and shorten the sarcomere. Now, what happens to the myofibril? Here we have a myofibril of undetermined length. What is that? One, two, three, four, five, six entire sarcomeres are illustrated here. And when you stimulate a neuromuscular junction, now remember that junction is not on the myofibril, it's out here on the fiber that contains it. You're going to contract each one of these one, two, three, four, five, six sarcomeres. And that means the ends of the myofibril are going to be pulled toward the center. If there is no 
if the ends are not anchored on some hard surface. So a good example of that is a sphincter muscle. We have the oris orbicularis, which is tacked down to the mandible and the, and the maxilla behind it, but isn't really there to move the mandible or maxilla. What it's there to do is to manage this opening. A sphincter muscle is in soft tissue. So when you contract it, it basically gets shorter, sort of like pulling the string on a pair of sweatpants, and the hole gets smaller. So when I contract that muscle, given that the muscle is not at the tip of the lip, but is behind the lip in the skin, circling it. So this really represents soft tissue, passive tissue, when I contract the orbicular resorus and making it shorter all over its length produces what we call pursing lips. Some people call this kissy mouth, some call it fish mouth. As you contract the orbicular resorus, it's not moving a joint of the skeleton. And uh, as a result, it gets shorter, but we don't see the movement of a joint. When we do a skeletal muscle movement, we typically anchor one end so that when we provide the same contraction, this end is anchored. We will call it the origin end. And this end is free to move. It's called the insertion end. And so the movement appears to be all on one end, pulling this end toward, pulling the insertion end toward the origin end. And this is how muscles are anchored to move a part of the skeleton. To kind of illustrate that, my favorite muscle, the biceps brachii, sits right here on the anterior surface of the humerus in the brachial region. It is the muscle that's there to flex the elbow, flex the elbow. The triceps brachii on the other side extends it. Up here at the shoulder, the two tendons that come off of the biceps brachial. That's why it's called biceps, two heads. They split and take up attachment across the shoulder joint on two different parts of the scapula. The short head comes here to the coracoid process. The long end runs over the top of the humerus in the intertubricular groove, just like a pulley and attaches to the top of the glenoid cavity. So to flex the elbow, we typically fix our shoulder, the origin end, and contract the muscle. The only end that's free to move is here. The other end, called the insertion, wraps around a bone marking on the radius called the radial tuberosity. And because when we want to flex our, our uh, elbow, we free up or restrict the movement at the two ends, we basically are going to pull this insertion closer to this origin. And that's what's happening down here. Now remember, always, always, muscles can only contract. You stimulate them, they contract. You stop stimulating them and they stop contracting. So for the biceps brachii, when I flex my elbow and then stop, it just basically drops back because gravity pushes it. But lie on your side and flex your elbow. When you stop flexing your elbow, it stays there. When you change the direction of gravity. Only contraction. So that means if we're going to want a joint like the elbow with back and forth, so we want to be able to flex and we want to be able to extend, then we're going to have to put muscles across two sides. Since this is a hinge joint, it doesn't go left and right. We're basically going to have the tricep, bicep brachii on this surface and on the posterior surface, the triceps brachii. When I do this with the biceps, it stretches the triceps. I then relax the biceps and contract the triceps, extending the elbow and returning the uh, lower arm to its original position. So what have we done here? We've gone all the way through anatomy my microanatomy, uh, the histology, the tissues, and the cells, and the chemicals of muscular contraction, showing the steps in of contraction in review, 
the nerve impulse and neurotransmitter dump, the nerve impulse racing down the T-tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, releasing the calcium and unlocking the actin. The repeated cross-bridge formation of myosin on actin active sites by binding, flexing, power stroke, releasing and cocking again, producing shortening as long as that uh, stimulation uh, continues. So here is the contraction beginning and basically shortening the uh, sarcomere as the end plates move in toward the middle. Now, after that contraction, notice something. You don't contract all the way down to zero. There's a range of motion in a sarcomere, and when it's fully contracted is when those end plates, those ends of the actin, are clear over here on the myosin end plate on both sides. But after that, you basically destroy the sarcomere if you poke it through that end plate. So it actually has a range of travel. It does not go down to zero. But when you relax it, there is then recovery. What do you have to do? You have to break down the acetylcholine, return it to the telodendrion, and repackage it in vesicles. You have to pump the calcium. This use, by the way, that takes ATP. This takes ATP to pump uh, the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so it's ready for the next stimulus. The active sites, uh, when the calcium leaves, that troponin and tropomyosin just rotates around back onto the active site and locks this in a relaxed position. So the myosin heads can all be recharged and wait, but until the actin's unlocked, it won't do anything more. And all that happens here is the contraction ends. Um, it may be gravity, it may be another muscle. It's some kind of movement that's gonna to have to take this sarcomere and stretch it back out. Now, the normal effect on a sarcomere. Sarcomere has a real length. We're going to start here, fully contracted at 1.2 micrometers, and go all the way up to 3.6 micrometers, which is actually overextended. And what we notice if we graph this next to the tension, the amount of uh, tension that is generated in this sarcomere is that you have this kind of central range, the normal range of sarcomere movement that produces the kind of peak highest range of tension. If you over contract the sarcomere, look how quickly the tension drops off from 1.6 down to 1.2 all the way to zero. And what's happening there is you've uh, at, at this point, this inflection point, shows you where the actin is actually running into the myosin plate. Beyond that, it's poking through. So now these actin fibers cannot form cross bridges. And if they form cross bridges, they exert force not to contract, but to uh, extend. So this is messed up. Over on the other side, if you stretch it out beyond this normal operating range, say to this point, at this point, notice that the areas of overlap are severely reduced by that overstretching. And so where you're losing the ability to form cross bridges, and we're drop again, dropping the tension off quickly. If you pull it this far, you've ruined the sarcomere. If you think about it, taking sticks and aligning them, pencils of different colors, and stacking them carefully so that they overlap in the center, and then basically you'll be able to slide them back and forth pretty easily. But if you pull them apart and then try to jam them back together, they don't go together in that close packing. And so the sarcomere is ruined. This is the function of the titan. About at this stage, with the myosin fibers basically growing into that titan, it basically stops overextension holds it so that actually incredible force is required to overcome it and pull those sarcomeres apart. In real life, what do muscles depend upon? I'm going to pause here and stop the recording. <laughs>
so that we can take a short break.